Our next presenter uh, is Karen Beeler from the University of Northern British Columbia, who will talk about canine bites, dogs' disability, and human health in short screen productions. Welcome, Karen, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm going to try to share my screen here. All right. Do you see the full screen mode? Perfect. OK, great. Well, thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your day to attend the session. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I live and work on the unceded territory of the Klikli Tene in Northern British Columbia, Canada. And I'm gonna be talking about canine bites or short videos, short films, dogs, disability and human health. Short form videos, including TikTok videos, have become favored media forms in part because of the recent COVID health restrictions that made it more difficult to film larger productions. The DIY practices of those working remotely or confined to their homes also likely contributed to the proliferation of these videos. Some of these video productions like Noodle the Pug's daily TikTok Bones Day or No Bones Day Media Bites have included entertaining dog content that has had a therapeutic effect on viewers. The canine human connection created through video production and transmission clearly resonated with audience in the midst of a global pandemic. However, this particular human animal health connection as demonstrated by the Bones Day or No Bones Day phenomenon is not limited to the recording of dogs in real life or in documentary style film. Dogs have been presented as a gauge or motivator for human health, disability and resilience in fictional screen productions as well short films such as The Present, Pip, and Old Dog. This paper will consider how condensed media forms such as animated short films, which feature dogs, are especially well-suited to health and disability-oriented messages, because like the Noodle TikTok video, these films can be easily accessed online by a range of viewers. Um, these films are all available online um, on their official websites as well as available elsewhere. In these screen productions, human canine health and interactions also cross boundaries and allow viewers to consider health issues pertinent to both species, the adoption of disabled pets, the care of older animals, and the reality that people of all ages live with disabilities. The movements of the characters or subjects along with various visual and sound techniques contribute to the solidification of human canine relations in these narratives. We live in an age that values the spontaneity and the condensed form of short videos like TikTok productions, Instagram reels, and YouTube shorts. Even K-pop artists have condensed YouTube videos called snap shoots or shorts, ranging anywhere from 10 seconds to three minutes. These kinds of compressed art forms convey short, clever, and often humorous visuals or statements that can create bonds between members of like-minded communities, K-pop artists and their fan base, for example. Many of these videos capture the everydayness of the performer's subjective experience, albeit with the addition of an unusual perspective. As Dave Jorgensen observes, quote, the 60 second time limit on TikTok forces you to boil down your diary entry to the essentials. One particular set of videos that captured the attention of millions of viewers during the COVID pandemic were the Bones Day or No Bones Day TikTok videos featuring Noodle, an elderly 13 year old pug, and his owner, New Yorker, Jonathan Graziano. Noodle's owner would position his dog on a bed, on a dog bed rather, and depending on whether Noodle maintained his position or flopped over, as you can see in these images, he would declare the day to be a bones day or no bones day for this pug. However, what established a strong connection between Noodle and his viewers was the fact that many people were experiencing no bones days during the COVID pandemic as well. A quote, conduit for communication, end quote, Noodle soon became a barometer for the mental health of viewers who would check in on his mood in order to determine how their own day might proceed. And here's an image of Freud and his, his chow chow Yofi, um, who served as a kind of a, a therapy dog presence uh, during uh, Freud's sessions. 
Noodle soon became, sorry, as Lauren Alley points out, Noodle's quote followers are able to find some sort of validation for the feelings they have each day, end quote. The reality that Noodle's health coincided with the challenging circumstances experienced by people around the world undoubtedly contributed to particularly keen viewer interest since mental and other health issues were pervasive during this time. It is worth adding here that Graziano carefully reformulated the message during television appearances and online in order to present a more positive view of the bones versus no bones distinction. Quote, though some speculated that Noodle's boneless predictions meant that the day is doomed, Graziano's interpretation is less dark. It's a no bones day and you know what that means. It means Noodle doesn't have to go on walkies and it means you must be kind to yourself. End quote. Like the Noodle TikTok video, short films are able to convey key messaging through a re relatively condensed format, under 10 minutes in length usually. Even the WHO or the World Health Organization seems to have recognized the relevance of the genre of short film and the role of health education, since they renewed a call for short films in 2021 for a film festival. According to film festival juror Dr. Mike Ryan, storytelling is an engagement between people. It's not just someone making a film. It's someone watching a film. Similar to the TikTok, similar to the Noodle video, the narratives in short films can function particularly well as a way of communicating health-related themes and images that are often more engaging than lengthy do documents on health or disability topics. Apologies to anyone in the field of health education. Stella Bolacki has discussed the ad the added benefit of animation in short documentaries as a way of raising, quote, public awareness by communicating the subjective experience of a variety of conditions to a wider audience, end quote. While documentary films may have been the traditional method of co communicating topics under the umbrella of health education, there has been an increase in the use of fiction as a popular way of presenting health-related messages to a wider audience. I would add that when anim animals mediate or populate the content of the film, like Noodle the Pug in the TikTok videos, there can be an even higher level of audience engagement. Short fiction films such as The Present, Pip, and Old Dog address various health or disability topics through their animated images or canine content, video bites, I would call those, and establish connections between human and canine, oops, between uh, human and canine characters, which then expand the understanding viewers have of disabled or ill people and animals. Jacob Fries or Jakob Fries short animated film, The Present, based on a comic strip by Brazilian artist Fabio Koala, is an award-winning production about a rather grumpy young boy whose mother has brought home a puppy as a present for him. The dog is missing a leg, however, and the video gaming child shows nothing but contempt for him once he notices this. The puppy is resilient, however, and exhibits great interest in playing with a red ball and while doing so manages to capture the boy's attention. When the puppy brings the ball to the boy, the viewer is shown a high angle shot of the dog looking up expectantly at the boy. Shortly thereafter, we hear some sounds of the boy moving and see his shadow as it moves across the dog's face. This sequence is followed by the reveal that the boy is using crutches because he is also missing a leg. The boy then leaves the house with his dog, throws the ball for the puppy, and is shown moving from right to left across the film screen. In the language of cinematography in Western culture, this could suggest an ongoing struggle for both characters since, quote, right to left movement often seems inexplicably tense and uncomfortable, end quote. Since they are not facing their challenges alone, however, the film subverts our usual expectations of this kind of movement on screen. The film conveys a human canine bond through the shared experience of disability. The unnamed dog acts as a powerful mediating force that persuades the unnamed boy to change from a sullen individual who wants to remain indoors to someone willing to try something new since his canine friend wants to play despite his own disability. It is worth noting that even in its animated form, the disabled canine is only minimally anthropomorphized. His eyes resemble the boys. Uh, show you that film. His eyes resemble the boys, but one could equally argue that the boys' eyes are zoomorphized as dog eyes, and or even that animation blurs that distinction between um, human and, and canine eyes. And the dog remains very dog-like in terms of his barks. 
The boy, on the other hand, is relatively quiet and does not speak much until the end. The fact that the earlier parts of the short film highlighted the dog's vocalization rather than the boy's suggests that the dog's behavior has con contributed to a change in the boy's attitude towards the limitations of his disability. Improved mental and physical health through play are likely to be on the horizon for both as part of their interdependent joint imaginary future. And the film may have also may also have the added benefit of changing viewers' attitudes, including children's, towards disability. It has been established that short films on the topic of health can have a particularly high impact on audiences who attend film festivals. But now that such films are often available online, their impact is even greater. Short films produced by organizations for the disabled, including Southeastern Guide Dogs and Purina Dog Chow, can reach even more viewers and potential, and potential donors online. One animated short film that highlights the role of a service dog for the visually impaired is Pip, a film produced by Southeastern Guide Dogs. As of this writing, the film has garnered over 407 million views. In contrast to the greater use of the objective perspective in the present, the film Pip accentuates the dog struggle through frequent POV shots. We observe the actions from the perspective of a puppy called Pip who initially falls short of the ability to serve as a guide dog for the visually impaired. The film begins with a downward tilt shot of a canine university at the Southeastern Guide Dogs facility and a shot of the statue of, black, of, the, of a black Labrador called Ace wearing a super cape. Later, a POV shot shows Pip, a yellow Labrador puppy, starting at staring at a wall of framed photos and Ace's ac accomplishments. Pip is also attending Canine University to become a guide dog and is in awe of Ace's achievements, especially after experiencing some difficulty learning what is expected of a guide dog. Although Pip does not have an obvious disability, she, the audio description version of the video identifies her as female, is presented as lacking when compared to the other dogs who are not only taller, but who perform their tasks correctly. While Pip does eventually learn the required guide dog tasks in practice sessions, she fails a final exam. However, in a twist typical of the short film genre, the dog shows her potential for work as a guide dog when she carries out an unconventional way of helping a blind person navigate around dangers at a construction site by placing her head through the woman's purse handle to create a makeshift harness, thus relaying the message that some dogs and people may achieve similar results through different yet creative approaches. In this instance, her smaller stature also proved to be an advantage and not a liability since she was able to squeeze under the gate of the canine university entrance to reach the person in need. The film offers a unique focus on the dog by minimizing the voices of the human characters, they only utter grunts and groans. Interestingly enough, Pip's voice is also limited to panting sounds and the occasional whimper. This allows viewers to focus on visual connections between canines and humans. Now, one could argue that this may alienate audience members who are visually impaired, but one of the unique features of the video site is that it also includes a link to an audio description for the vid visually impaired. This link reinforces the inclusivity that such a short film can offer, and in my case, made me realize that Pip was a female puppy and not male as I had incorrectly assumed. Great expectations, anyone? The film may also be intended to reach people who can help those who benefit from guide dog programs, since there is a link on the film's website so that viewers can donate to Southeastern Guide Dogs. The final short film that I would like to examine in relation to canine presence in disability and health narratives is a can Canadian film, Old Dog. Unlike the other two films I've discussed here, Old Dog relies predominantly on the human being's point of view through POV shots and voiceover narration. Anne-Marie Fleming's film focuses on an elderly dog, an elderly pug, I have a thing for pugs, obviously, <laughs> elderly pug called Henry, as viewed through the eyes and narration of his elderly owner. Pugs are a popular companion dog for seniors, and despite numerous health conditions in the breed, some live to be 12 to 15 years of age. For these reasons, the pug breed may be particularly effective in conveying messages about the human canine bond through similar experiences pertaining to aging. The film's senior content was coincidentally inspired by a different Anne-Marie Fleming, who, quote, owns Dog Quality in 100 Mile House, BC. That's about four, four hours away driving distance from Prince George, where I'm based. 
And uh, she sells accessories and furniture, specifically strollers, ramps, and diapers for senior dogs at, with mobility and incontinence issues. Like the other films we have examined, Old Dog reinforces the canine human bond, and in this case, a spare sketchbook style of rotoscope anima animation is used. Remember the video, Take On Me? As in the other films, the dog is limited to dog language, like barks or whimpers, while a voiceover narration is provided by his human companion. The dog's ailments, the opening image of a dog, of a pug in a doggy diaper is the first image of compromised health, uh, serves, sorry, the dog's ailments serve as a gateway to a consideration of the elderly man's diminished health, poor vision, hearing loss, aching joints, and incontinence. The narrator offers an explanation for his dog's disability. Quote, with his, hip, with his hip thing, he suffers from incontinence, quote. But by the end of the film, the viewer can surmise that much of what the elderly man has said about Henry, a literal old dog, is probably also true for the human old dog. The elderly canine and the old man therefore have a symbiotic metonymic relationship. And as um, Anne-Sophie Lundgren argues, Unlike metaphor, which substitutes and usurps the animal, metonymic and parallel readings can emphasize connection, recognition, relation, and correspondence between humans and animals. The two are visually, the two being the, um, the pug and um, the human being, are visually connected through their purple underwear and through their similar stilted movement away from the camera at the end of the film, thus solidifying their cross-species bond in the face of old age. To conclude, whether functioning as com companions or working guide dogs, the dogs in these short films, the present Pip and Old Dog, and Noodle the Pug in the TikTok videos serve as a conduit for a better understanding of human health and disability. Yet while these short films all under five minutes convey some intersectionality between canines and human beings, they still suggest a greater appreciation for the challenges experienced by each species by not endowing the dog characters with human voices and by utilizing movement, aesthetic and sound techniques that transform the narratives of disability or inadequacy into unique representations of adaptation. In many ways, the actions of these canine figures, including Noodle the Pug's Bones Day or No Bones Day positions, really do speak louder than words. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen, for this uh, insightful talk about human-dog relations, especially with, with a view towards health questions. Um, and the panel speaker in our panel now is Samantha Barros, uh, whose presentation is titled Press X to Pet Human-Animal Interactions in Video Games. Welcome, Samantha. Hello. Let me get that up quickly. And I've had Zoom semi-regularly randomly stop sharing my screen. So if that happens, please please flag me so that I can make sure it is working properly. Um, so yes, my title of my paper is Press X to Pet. And yes, I am quite proud of that title. Um, I thought it was personally hilarious. Um, you And here on the screen is my own cat watching me play the game stray, which I just thought was a fun way to start it off, but I'm not actually talking about stray. Um, so the Twitter account, Can You Pet the Dog, strives to answer a pretty simple question um, and self-obvious. Can you, in fact, pet the dog in a video game? This account has over half a million followers, as you can see on the screen. And as I was preparing this presentation, that number honestly kept going up every time I checked the account. So this is a very active and very popular Twitter account. So the creator, Tristan Cooper, denies he has anything to do with this. But the rise in the popularity of this account, um, as you can see, started in March of 2019, can be mapped to the rise of the ability for players to pet dogs in video games and the increase in advertising of the same. Um, these are just four games that have come out fairly recently um, that 
allow you to pet the dogs. In fact, the one there in the bottom that just says you can pet the dog is coming out next year from the same studio that um, published Stray, in fact. So despite the general uselessness of animal petting and gameplay, it almost never features in progressing a quest or completing some sort of goal. It's just something players like to do. The players like demand this feature extensively. Um, here's just one of the many memes about animal petting in video games. But really there's a question of why? <laughs> So you can see this was posted three years ago on Reddit, which is roughly the same time that that Twitter account started to become very popular. So I fall into the camp of people who are in fact delighted with the ability to pet dogs or other animals in games, but I also resonate with this person's confusion. Why do we actually want to do this? What goal does it achieve? I have three cats. I can pet an animal whenever I feel like it, if they let me. Um, so one of the replies to this Reddit thread, which is pretty long, so I'm not going to post it up here, but it, they argue that we want a sense of realism in games. We can pet dogs in real life, so we want to pet dogs in our virtual lives, our virtual experiences as well. And I do think that this uh, Redditor is on to something here. So assuming a human player character PC in an anthropocentric game framework, i.e. not Animal Crossing, right? We do want to pet the animals to gain a, gain a sense of realism, but only partially because we can do so in real life. Rather, I argue that the sense of realism we are after is the American categorization of animals. Animals in video games generally serve four functions. Resources and equipment. So this is a shot from Tomb Raider with Lara Croft about to shoot a deer. Set dressing, whoops, set dressing. So for fellow gamers in the room, think about how many chickens are in settlements. They're just always chickens around, specifically chickens um, that kind of give you this fantasy vibe, right? This medieval, look, people have chickens here. Um, enemies, so this is a bear from Red Dead Redemption 2 or companions, and this is from Destiny 2. So these categories can be blurry, of course, so Roach from The Witcher serves as both a companion um, and, and equipment. So you can literally equip Roach from your inventory, but also there is a side quest that is kind of catered around Roach and her experiences. Um, but generally these categories are clear to the point the game makers generally don't have to explain their function because they're in alignment with our real life experiences. We know bears are dangerous. We don't need the game player, the game designers to explain that to us. If you see a bear in real life, do not approach. Um, for the average American, there is no overlap between a resource animal and a pet animal. A pet often lives in the house, is considered part of the household or even part of the family. Billions of dollars are spent on pets in America every year. A resource animal, on the other hand, say a cow, is not even considered an animal by the average American, probably not even thought about. She is a product that arrives in the form of hamburger, steak, milk, and cheese, ice cream, et cetera. Because of the mundanity of these distinctions, they are easy to ignore. But in video games, they are much more obvious because of the prescriptiveness of allowable interactions. The developers give players only a limited range of options regarding their actions and interactions with non-human animals are prescribed based on these exact categories. Resource animals you can kill and harvest, equipment animals you can ride or, uh, ride or command, and companion animals you can pet. So Cooper's specific impetus in making his Twitter account um, the Can You Pet the Dog account, was that he couldn't pet sad dogs in a game. This is upsetting to him and to other players because it disrupted the way humans normally think about the relationships with dogs. Um, according to uh, Tuan here from Dominance and Affection, um, pets are an expression of dominance with a velvet glove. However, affect, quote, however, affection is not the opposite of dominance, rather it is dominance anodyne. It is dominance with a human face. Dominance may be cruel and exploitative with no hint of affection in it. What it produces is a victim. On the other hand, dominance may be combined with affection and what it produces 
is the pet. We expect this kind of relationship with our pets, one that we can exert um, affection within. So he opens this book by asserting that any account, quote, uh, any account of human reality seems to call for an understanding of the nature of power. Um, thus, the realism that is craved in the ability to pet the dog in a video game is not actually the ability to pet the dog, but a mimicry of our real life relationships to animals. So in this presentation, I'm going to take a look at three different, three different instances in three different games. Alice, a German Shepherd from The Last of Us 2, the release of Fortnite patch 8.40, which allowed players to pet dogs, and Patrick Lenton's viral Twitter thread about protecting his dog in Skyrim. So these three examples of what I call petable dogs speak to cultural and material anxieties surrounding companionate human animal relationships. Um, incapable of interacting with pet type animals in friendly or familiar ways within games, players either must acknowledge the arbitrariness of anthropocentric friend object divides or reassert the illogics of contemporary American anthropocentrism and demand the ability to press X to pet. So I present these games as more of a series of provocations but only a brief sampling of texts rather than a comprehensive overview. Um, I believe all the attendees of this conference have figured this out as I'm talking about three games that no one else has mentioned and we've mentioned dozens of games thus far in this conference. Um, so my argument here hopefully can be expanded or morphed to apply to many different texts. So The Last of Us 2 is a sequel to, surprisingly, unsurprisingly, The Last of Us. Um, so these are nominally third person zombie slash horror survival games set in the Pacific Northwest, um, specifically Washington State. So I'm going to try avoiding as many spoilers as possible, but obviously I do have to talk about Alice. So Alice is a German shepherd who you encounter um, multiple times throughout the game. So The Last of Us 2 follows the teenagers Ellie and Abby. Um, the gameplay covers the same three-day period from each girl's perspective who are presented as antagonists of each other as you occupy each um, character's perspective. So Alice um, is part of Abby's party along with some humans when you are controlling her character. So most of the player's interactions are as Abby interacting with Alice because Alice is with you for most of the game. Um, uh, Alice is a trained attack dog, but is very friendly and acts more pet-like, which is what we generally expect of German Shepherds, I think, toward Abby and her friends. So these behaviors serve as a plot point in the game as Alice comforts um, two children Abby rescues at one point. And the screenshots of this game are going to be very dark. The game is just dark, like visually dark and narratively dark, so I apologize. Um, but Ellie's narrative comes first. The player's first interaction with Alice is actually violent. Ellie has tracked Abby down to where she's hiding with some of her friends, but Alice finds Ab uh, Ellie first and attacks. So the player is then presented with a button prompt on the screen to fight off Alice. If the player succeeds, Ellie will kill Alice. If the player fails, Ellie dies and the player has to try again. Only success will allow the game to move forward. Thus, Alice is an enemy here and failure to fight the enemy results in a game over for the player. But shortly after this scene, the player switches to Abby's perspective and one of the first actions the player can take is to play fetch with a dog. This is Bear and he interrupts the player um, as Abby and demands a game of fetch. And as far as I know, the player can comply and throw the ball as an unlimited number of times. Um, my, I watched, I primarily watched my husband play this game and he got tired of throwing the ball way before I got tired of watching it. Um, so Alice is as active in the game slash narrative as the other humans within the game. And much like Abby will shout encouragement to the humans during fight sequences, she also prays Alice. Additionally, Alice will give Abby quests, so to speak, to complete. For instance, she also demands a game of fetch at one point, and the player cannot progress in the game until they throw the squeaky toy a requisite number of times. And yeah, it's a squeaky toy and she will squeak it. It's very cute. Um, so thus, Alice is positioned, at least in Abby's narrative, as an important and equal member of the team, so to speak. But our first interactions with Alice will always be Ellie killing her. That 
doesn't chronologically come first, but in the player's experience of the game, that is the first interaction with Alice. Um, and no amount of positive interactions playing as Abby will erase the knowledge that Alice dies by our hand and we have no choice in the matter. So we get no choice either as Abby or Alice, the, uh, Abby or Ellie. Ellie, Alice, why did they name them that? But anyway, when Alice attacks Ellie, the only option is to literally just button mash until Ellie kills Alice. There's no option to run away or hide like there is with most of the other um, enemies within the game. Similarly, petting and playing with Alice is either part of a cutscene or necessary to progress the narrative. So much of the point, in my opinion, there isn't enough room to go into this here, of The Last of Us 2 is to put the players in this helpless position. And that cr creates this moral narrative tension and distress within the player that is imposed by the developer's choice to give the players no essential choice with this. You, you have to just button mash. You can't do anything else. You don't get to pick how you kill Alice. You get no choice in any of this. So in demanding the option to pet the game, the players are exerting a type of choice and agency in other video games, such as Fortnite. So Fortnite is a multiplayer game. It's very popular with the youths um, that uh, introduced the ability in patch 8.40 to purchase in-game dogs. And players demanded the ability to pet them. For the Fortnite devs complied, but players were not happy. Players could only pet other people's dogs. And according to multiple reviewers, the petting action looked like the door opening action. And this left players deeply unsatisfied because they wanted something more realistic. So you can see here, you can only pet someone else's dog. So from the devs perspective, this probably seemed like a silly thing to include, hence perhaps, perhaps that's why there's this lackluster effort. After all, petting the dogs does nothing to add to the gameplay. But for the players, I argue the ability to pet dogs adds a sense of realism to this game by rewarding their in-game dogs for being good boys. When a dog properly performs a task for a human, they get rewarded. For anyone who has a dog, you are familiar with this phenomenon, I'm sure. But like Tuan said, just because the relationship is amicable or even familial doesn't remove the anthropocentric dominance. Many dog training manuals encourage the assertion of humans as the alpha dog and that any dogs in the family need to be fully obedient and only upon that obedience should the dog receive affection. Virtual dogs, on the other hand, are always obedient because they are programmed that way. Hence, the players feel a need to reward the dog in some way, even though there is no actual reward going on here. And if the dog doesn't obey and isn't obedient and isn't compliant to human's wishes, as in the case of Alice, the player could just kill the dog, which is unfortunately also our reality. Um, many dogs are killed due to provoked attacks, that sort of thing. So The Last of Us 2 relies on a lack of choice in interacting with Alice paired with the average American's association with dogs to the heart-wrenching stories. Fortnite, adding dogs and the ability to interact with them much later in the game, this was patch 8.40 after all, doesn't bring the same degree of realism to the player's experience that works so successfully for the characters of The Last of Us 2. Even The Last of Us 2 doesn't give a choice while Fortnite does. The Last of Us 2 makes dog petting integral to the storyline, comforting, Alice is comforting the children, she's part of the party, etc. Um, but simultaneously, the players cannot choose to pet Alice outside of those cutscenes. Fortnite gives the players these choice, but it's inconsequential and poorly executed. So for I kind of for the close of my presentation, I want to try to hit a middle ground here and look at Skyrim. So explaining Skyrim is kind of difficult for anyone who's played it, you know what I'm talking about, but to kind of summarize the most relative points here, it's a massive open world game that allows the player a high degree of customization of their character in appearance, action, skills, careers, etc. There's also no in-game impetus to complete the quote unquote main quest. And the player can spend hours upon hours upon hours doing all sorts of side quests that have little to no bearing on the main quest. Um, so this talking about Skyrim narratively kind of falls apart. So I'm going to kind of focus on one person's experience of playing this game. So this is Patrick Lenton, who 
is kind of an internet personality. Um, he's published some written works, but he's gotten a lot of viral fame for this Twitter thread. So he opens this thread. It's many, many tweets long. Um, I rec It's very entertaining. Um, but he opens a thread by claiming the worst part of the game is when he found an abandoned dog and he, quote, of course had to adopt the dog because I'm not a monster. This logic is a central component to my previous two analyses, right? Ellie is most obviously monstrous in killing, Al uh, killing Alice. The player feels bad about this. They're supposed to feel bad about this. Um, especially as later you become good friends with Alice as Abby. Fortnite players feel bad when they can't pet their dogs. They're missing something from the essential relationship between a human and a dog. So Lenton continues that he his anxiety continually increased after he rescued this dog because the dog just follows you around while you fight dragons and do all these other things and is at risk of being killed. Um, so he just decides that he needs to find a safe place for his dog, discovers that if he builds a house, the dog will move into this house, but only if the, there is a child in the house who becomes friends with the dog. And there's a bunch of uh, issues that arise in this. The, the child first wants a rat, and then so he has to get a second child who likes the dog. It's a whole thing. But my point is really here that he ultimately needs to create a domestic atmosphere for this dog, and that is the proper place of a dog where a dog will be safe. So the player originally finds the dog. Um, whoops, there we go. The player originally finds the dog in a cabin with a dead human. Um, we can presume that this was the dog's like first human, so to speak. Um, and this is the point where you can decide to adopt the dog. And so this, the narrative of this quest to re is to return the dog to a domestic space with specifically a child. Lenton also, his player character also is married. So his wife is installed in this house as well. So Linton must adopt a child, build a proper home and bring his in-game wife into the home to raise the child, eventually two children, in order to convince the dog to stay in the house instead of going adventuring with the player. So much of the humor of Lenton's thread comes from the number of steps he must accomplish, but the necessity of building a home for the dog that is occupied by a wife and child, children, is not really questioned. This is the natural, pla natural place that a dog belongs. Um, the entire quest is ultimately about imposing this sense of realism. Where do we find dogs? In houses. Um, on this human-animal relationship by mimicking the human-animal relationship the majority of Americans have. Um, even in his tweets, he says that his dog deserves to rest in his old age by the hearth, right? This is the image we have of dogs and where they belong. So although my consideration of these texts is necessarily brief, hopefully through these three short examples, I demonstrated how one aspect of the realism um, of video games comes from reliance on anthropocentric norms of human animal relationships. It is worth noting that the sense of realism is embedded in a science fiction game, uh, like a fantasy science fiction, like multiplayer fighting game, and a very high like Lord of the Rings style fantasy game. So realism isn't necessarily high on the list here, but this sense of realism is desired and obtained through our interactions with dogs. Alice represents the humanity slash monstrosity of the ca characters and thus the player in the game. Because the unsatisfactory player dog interactions in Fortnite go against out of game human dog interactions in the real world, they upset players. Lenten's Skyrim quest relies on a specific understanding of domesticity and domestication and dog's place in the home. All of these narrative points and emotional points and their success or lack thereof is reliant upon these assumptions of how human animal relationships should function. So as these games rely on anthropocentric categories of species, thus when players are denied the ability to interact with the occupants of these categories in the expected ways, they're distressed and anxious because these categories become uncomfortable. Pet type animals can be differentiated from resource type animals through positive interactions like petting. When we can't pet the dogs, 
what does that make a dog in a video game? Is it a resource? Is it set dressing? But that's not how we feel about dogs in real life, right? Soothing our anxieties around interspecies interactions while reinforcing the anthropocentric perspective that permits animals to be seen as nothing more than resources is encapsulated in our ability to press X to pet. Thank you. And there's my email address if you wish to contact me for any reason. Thank you. And I will stop Samantha, sharing now. For this lively talk. <laughs> Um, since I just expect the usual route at this point, I guess I'll start asking questions before and then anyone else might join the discussion, including, of course, the panelists, if you feel so. Um, I feel like I have to start with the last one at, in the, uh, at this point now. Um, the thing that I, I, I instantly thought of um, when you showed the, 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 the image of, from, from The Witcher I can't remember. It's been quite a while, and I didn't play The Witcher Three that long. Um, but in Red Dead Redemption Three, I'm pretty sure you can actually pet the horse. So it's it's arguably kind of crossing that divide between a resource because it's clearly a resource that helps you go along it that you can you know load up and all that stuff, but you can also pet it. And there is also this sort of kind of it's pre made pretty clear that there is some sort of relationship between the the, the player character and the horse that he rides. So what about that particular instance? That the petting of horses is always very interesting. And I think Roach is, like I mentioned briefly, is kind of the most like complicated example of this because the horse is named um, Geralt. We know, we learn names all of his horses roach <laughs> um and and yeah you can pet the horse in red dead redemption um but in tomb raider 2 you can also pet the llamas just kind of randomly um <laughs> but the llamas are clearly like in pens they are like farmed animals so there's this element i think of game devs knowing people like to pet the animals and just sort of randomly throwing it in um, because then people are like, oh, I can pet the, I can pet the llama. And, but it's still like, you can buy llama based goods. Like you can buy llama wool, I believe. And you can see the inhabitants of that area of the game, like, like weaving and making cloth and stuff. So, you know, that there's no sheep. So you, you know, where those things came from. Um, and on the other side, you have um some not all but many of the assassin creed games you can just like interchangeably flip out if you have a horse or a camel or whatever to ride on and they're given like no names um and you could just like steal a horse you just knock someone off their horse and you just take it so there's like this huge spectrum of is ride are rideable animals resources or companions or both um and then this gets into like another realm when you think about any games where you have like mythical creatures you can ride like dragons um it's yeah the rideable animal category is 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 complicated um and it really depends i think on how the game narratively structures your relationship to the animal like gerald and roach partially because those are based on books right but you have a very clear relationship with Roach. Like Geralt takes good care of Roach. You only ever have Roach to ride. Um, you can't get a new horse, it's impossible. Um, versus games like Assassin's Creed where you can literally get a new horse whenever you feel like it. Um, and then you like equip the horse and the horse like is literally, if you go to your inventory, the horse is in your inventory. <laughs> um, so, or the camel in some of the games you can ride a camel um so yeah it's the the rideable category is kind of kind of complicated um even in the last of us two you can ride a horse um uh ellie rides a horse into the ruins of seattle um but you just basically abandon that horse <laughs> in seattle 
<laughs> just like bye and it's like oh okay I was kind of like oh okay we're just gonna leave the horse here to get eaten by the mushroom zombies <laughs> which in the case of the last of us is more interesting if you kind of think back of the comics paradox of the first game where there's this huge kind of it's um Ellie's key first interaction with nature basically kind of finding a horse but yeah that's the setup for me in a certain mm -hmm. way yeah um 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 okay thanks for that uh Karen I, I was wondering um since all of the uh short films that you sort of discussed were or are um animation most of them I guess even digital an animation mm -hmm. um which at the end of the day gives us this very much this opportunity to, you know, form the animal in any way we want. You don't, you know, need, need to train it to act in certain ways, but you can basically, it's malleable in a certain way. So I was wondering in how far that might impact those particular narratives and whether there's any, or whether you've come across any examples that actually are live action similar to, to these. Uh, I guess I, I, I chose to sort of look at uh, films that I had come across in the context of that um, that that health um, message, but uh, and so some of it was fortuitous, I suppose that there there was um, animation there. But um, yeah, I haven't really sort of explored um, further, you know, to look at the the live action messages. In part, what intrigued me was the fact that yeah, the the animation was a different way of of reaching audiences maybe even younger audiences and engaging them with with those messages um and becoming you know even potential donors or maybe if they were disabled themselves as younger viewers um having a look at that uh human animal bond and and engaging with it and the animation i think facilitated it although i do recognize it means that one can sort of shape animals but I, even in live action clearly animal actors are, are shaped and placed and staged right so um that could be equally problematic even though we might have the sense that this is definitely more realistic we have an actual dog as opposed to an animated dog um so yeah i think film in general can can sort of manipulate but yeah that would be worth sort of look, looking into as i said i kind of wanted to look at the the animation as in, and the fiction combined um, to get a little bit further away from you know health films and, and documentary style films but um, yeah it's definitely something I'll, I'll look into I, I'm not aware of um, I mean based on my uh, on my research I think there have been um, I'm just trying to think now um, I guess I'm more away, more aware of sort of the real situations where animals are used to to assist um, people in therapy um, as well, whether it's mental illness or um, in nursing homes. And I went there, you know, with my my dog as well. But um, yeah, I'll um, I'd have to look at it. And one one more thing to do, future project. Thanks for bringing that up. Didn't mean to cause additional work <laughs> <laughs> no it's always great uh, another paper in the future <laughs> actually i have a question for you too karen um because um when you browse tiktok for your research um were there certain kinds of animals more present than other kinds of animals. We've seen now um, dogs, and you also talked about cats, I think. And what struck me as interesting was that in two of your examples, the, the breed shown were pugs, which are uh, themselves a, I don't know how to say this properly, a, a heavily impaired breed because of human actions. And is this what you see when you when you look at TikTok that, for example, pugs um, are used in videos on health education or disability disability education because they are themselves yeah in some kind impaired. You maybe you know what I mean. I just find it interesting that pugs are being used. Yeah, 
bra bra brassy or brachycephalic breeds is the term for those breeds with pushed in faces like French yeah. bulldogs and, and, yeah. and uh, pugs and uh, uh, what other breeds, um, boss, um, boxers as well. Boxers, depending yes. Yeah, and, and of course there's variation depending on how they're bred. You can breed them you know, with more extended faces, but kennel clubs have breed standards and some things are preferred. That's a really, really great question. Um, you know, I, I think I, I should say here, um, just full, full disclosure here that I am not um, one of these people who looks at TikTok videos all the time. I don't have a TikTok, uh, access to TikTok that way. So this is kind of via in a circuitous way, um, because I was familiar with the noodle phenomenon, largely through other kinds of media discussions. And then I saw, you know, some of the TikTok videos. But um, I think, um, yeah, certainly. Um, so your your question is whether the the pug sort of this distorted appearance and, and the fact that they um, have these issues may make people more aware of them in the context of, of disability. I would say, I think there's this kind of denial among the general populace that these breeds have, have issues. I know there's been more criticism coming from the UK and um, I would say in Europe largely um, compared to, to the North American context. The breed, pugs are used in all sorts of commercials and um, I forgot the, um, the program um, uh, is a, um, a television series that that had a pug appearing uh, recently. Why can't I remember it? Anyway, um, and then also even in um, in the home home factual television, like those um, home renovation shows, one of the people there has has her black pugs, um, uh, you know, that are there with her as she's talking about homes with <laughs> with uh, clients. So uh, yeah, and so there isn't that kind of in the popular culture, that kind of discussion. But I think people also, some sectors are aware of it, bringing attention to this. Maybe, maybe that can facilitate it. I guess rather than looking at their their flat faces and those issues, I think there is some awareness that they do have other um, health conditions and um, mostly that they but they, they can grow older and they are favored companion for the elderly. So that was, that's how I sense they're presented there that yes, you know, the pug in the old dog video um, is also um, getting older and you see him with a, uh, like a pug wheelchair, pug stroller. You know, so that's some kind of um, image there, but other breeds use wheelchairs too. So I don't know whether the pug in particular is um, is chosen because of the um, other health conditions, but um, you know, certainly old dogs in general, you know, can have eye problems and hearing problems. So, um, but it is it is um, interesting question, yeah. Um, and um, I think just it's the cute the cuteness factor. A lot of people think they're cute. You either think they're cute or they're ugly, right? And the people who think they're cute, um, they're, they're quite a lot of them. Even my own pug, um, I was something think, how could somebody say it's it, she's cute? But <laughs> um, some people say that, and it's just the, the perception. Yeah. So, um, and was there another part of your question that I didn't answer, or? No, you did. You oh. did cover it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, I think there is, like I say, some level of denial with some of these breeds. They, other things come to the forefront rather than some of the health problems that you address. Yeah. I did have a question as well, but I don't know if Samantha wanted to go ahead first, but I have a question for, for Elizabeth and Samantha, or did somebody else want to go first? I guess Samantha would be on. Uh, my question is um, for Elizabeth, so it might overlap with Karen's. We'll find out. Um, but I, especially after the round table, I have, and even when I was playing the game, I thought a lot about Stray in a post-humanist context. And um, I think that this, this post-humanist framework is really interesting and 
for and possibly quite fruitful for thinking about games where you play as animals and I was just wondering if you've given any thought to applying this framework to games where the player character is non-human um specifically an animal I do believe there are games where you can play as a robot but which would also fall in the post-humanist context but I'm more interested in animals obviously um so the answer to that question might just be a flat out no but I'm curious <laughs> so the answer if I already applied this to um, games with animal avatars is no, but I thought about it too, and I plan to do a PhD in this in this kind of uh, section of game studies. <laughs> and um, yeah, the games I chose were Absu and the Pathless with the human or humanoid avatars. Um, I think they hold the potential to um really reflect on what you relate to to animals and how you relate as an animal yourself to animals as a human animal and for me this has been more um more attractive to look into until now because i'm a human myself and i can i can uh, i can imagine what it means to be human in a certain situation when i play a human avatar but when I think of posthumanist approaches and posthumanist ontology and what it implies for um, how different beings experience being in a world, then a game where you play an animal avatar begs the question even more of who plays and who the avatar is. The, the, uh, the avatar being kind of an assemblage of the, the player, but also the, the entity. And then with all of what's coming from the game world, effects from the game world. And well, I have a background in philosophy. And for me, it's, it's just so difficult to assume a position and where I get the, get the impression we talked about shelter yesterday. And you you mentioned Stray. I haven't played either, but I know what um, what each of the game is about. But they mimic this what it's like to be a cat, and you cannot you cannot possibly think of what it's like to be a cat as a cat because you've never been in a cat's skin. That's what Jason Wallen mentioned yesterday with uh, Thomas Nagel, Thomas Nagel's "What's it like to be a bat?" <laughs> so I think posthumanist is Presumably, approaches are fruitful in the sense that they can sharpen our human senses for other beings and how they relate to each other and to the world, but only from from a human perspective. So I felt more comfortable, as I'm new to posthumanism, to um, operate with human or humanoid avatars. But I can perfectly see this, and there are also um, scholars who work in that field like the um, Marco Caracciolo who I mentioned who looks at Untitled Goose Game in his um, in his article for gamestudies.org and uh, yeah I think uh, Bo Ruberg also looked at deers <laughs> and yeah I and Tom Tyler had a book this year that you might have already heard about in the electronic mediation series. Um, and I think he looks at different kinds of animals and also animal avatars as well. So this was a really extensive answer and I don't know if that was what you were aiming at, but nonetheless, I found it interesting to, <laughs> to uh, be asked such a question. Thank you. Karen? Yeah, thanks for starting that off, uh, Samantha. I, I was kind of similar to my, my question as, as well. And uh, Elizabeth, thank you for sort of discussing the, the complicated aspect of trying to sort of merge with the, with the animal presence because we really don't know. But having said that, I think, um, you know, these are, these are constructs, right? And we are within this kind of fictional context. I found it really interesting the way you were talking about building that 
connection to the animals by the mirroring and the, having the uh, human character swim alongside, right? Trying to um, um, show that 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 bond in a way with um, with an animal in a different way, and of course, things like camera angles can facilitate that. You know, the P a POV shot. I don't know how often that happens within the games you described. Are there like point of view shots from the point of view of the animals, or are they predominantly the human being just close to the animal from the perspective of um, of of the human. I, I'd be curious to hear that. And then also your thoughts on whether, um, well, I think you partly answered it. I, it seems to me you don't think um, having a POV or point of view from the um, perspective of, of the animal in these games would really um, enhance the, um, sort of the power of the animal. You think it can be accomplished equally well through just mirroring because we really don't know an animal is that your sense of how the point of view works in these games i think that's one of the most interesting questions as to how virtual games or video games might enable a certain aesthetic experience that mm -hmm. makes becoming animal a possibility or how will video games mediate this Mm -hmm. This thought that humanity had for a very long time. I uh, know of many artists who try to be an animal by living with goats and eating grass with their teeth and, and stuff like this. Um, and I, in, in a zoo, for example, when you observe, you're always in an, obser in an observer position. You never have the the POV of an animal or the like. You're always the, looking at the avatar or you're looking at an animal, but um, when you're looking at an animal, you're not controlling the animal. But when you're observing, as I said, an anchovy, for example, which is like a very, very small fish and you're in your shoal and you're just diving uh, around the level, there are other predators who can potentially um, just snack you. And um, then your target switches and you uh, switch to the predator, to the perspective of the predator. And I felt as I, as I observed this, as I played this, that being observing an anchovy was really tense because I always thought, oh man, uh, it's going to be a snack anytime. But when I was this big, big ass fish who was just swimming along and looking where to find a snack, I felt really, really comfortable in this position and very calm and was like, mm -hmm, okay, that's like a serene landscape or a seascape or whatever. So I think video, video games do hold the potential to give us an idea of how is it to be small in a world or how is it to be, to be big in a world? How is it to be um, um, the predator in a world? How is it to be the prey? Um, but not how is it to be an anchovy, and yeah. if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I think you know Brett Mills' keynote um, addresses the POV of the shark, right? We do we do have POV with the use of the technology, and but is that really the way a shark sees? And you know, I guess unless you've studied it, even when scientists you know talk about how animals see how dogs see the color spectrum or limited color spectrum it's really only guesswork right you can try to approximate that with cinematography but it, you know we don't as you say we we don't know for, for sure but um it, it is for some people that is makes it more effective um i did have a question sort of related for Sa samantha as well if i could unless somebody else wants to ask something first I think you can, can just go ahead and I think okay. unless Samantha, because she also turned off her mic, she has another question that will I, might be our I last. Didn't, I didn't have another question. I was just going to jump in on the previous one, but I'll let Karen ask her question instead. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I was really yeah intrigued by um, your discussion of that that feature to be able to pet the dog in, the, in these video games. And I, I was just wondering, you know, why... Um, whether you think that demand came from people who are pet lovers and, and you know, or 
um, have pets in their own household and want to sort of transpose that, um, superimpose that on, onto the game and if they see an animal, they want that, that feature? Or is this based on their experience of what they've seen in other video games? So do other video games and their experiences in those video games dictate what they expect of other video games that have pets or, you know, is it, is it both really? Um, what's your sense of why people really, you know, wanted these, these features um, or even if they aren't pet lovers, that's the social construction of expectation that's been created. I know it's hard to tell without any kind of empirical studies, but um, maybe based on some of the things. Yeah, you've the, yeah without a true, um, yeah, it, like you said, an empirical study of kind of going through these, you know, Reddit and uh, forums and reviews and like all of these sorts of things. Um, I think that that's, hard to give a definitive answer to. I will say that in the Reddit thread um, that I mentioned toward the beginning of my presentation and the reviewer who, or the, not the reviewer, the Redditor who said that we were looking for a sense of realism, part of their reason of why they particularly enjoyed this feature is that they were super allergic to animals. So they couldn't, they couldn't pet an actual animal because it would give them a severe allergic reaction. Um, so I think that there, there might be a space of people who don't necessarily, don't or can't access, um, interactions with animals. That's part of it. Um, I definitely think that pet lovers is a big, and people who have pets is a big, um, motivator behind why people are kind of clamoring for this, this feature. Um, and Ben, I think that yeah, has it become a convention in video games to the point that it needs to be seen everywhere? You know, I think I think it has to some degree, and my this is this is a little bit of a gut feeling, and kind of just through reading the "Can You Pet the Dog" Twitter, um, because the uh, Tristan Cooper who runs that Twitter has started being given early access to a lot of video games so that before the game releases, he can post, yes, you can pet the dog in this game. So it's now because now because it is, it's like a, there's a demand for it. There is a platform to specifically share this and game like game, creators who rely a lot of times on these like the YouTube and TikTok and what you know Game Insider and all these places to like review the games right um they're now including this very 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 specific Twitter account in part of their advertising for the game right so and the there will be um especially like indie game developers who aren't coming from big studios who he will be retweeting um, in his Twitter thread, because on their Twitter threads, they are advertising that you can pet the dog or whatever animal it might be. It's not always a dog. It's usually a dog, but it's not always a dog. Um, so I do think that there is, there has become a sort of momentum effect of now people are expecting it. So it's being added to games. Now, like you said, without a real empirical study, of like, has there been a, a true rise and not just an like a what appears to be a rise in this ability? Um, I can't really definitively attest to that, but I think at least in terms of um, what capitalism is saying in giving reviewers these advanced access copies, there is. <laughs> Yeah, I think we've just demonstrated how there's that proliferation within within the media, all these sort of <laughs> um, integrated ways of media commenting on other media, the the, the meta <laughs> the meta aspect of it um, that almost supersedes, you know, any kind of realistic wish for, you know, imitating <laughs> life. Um, it's it becomes more about all, all that media. I, I should show you here. You've been talking about petting the dog. I found this sort of stress stress ball, which is about you know squeezing 
squeezing the pug if you're uh, stressed out, which is complicated too in terms of dominance and, <laughs> and affection. The, the cat, my cat that I had on my title slide, she's been sitting behind my monitor here for this whole presentation. I kept uh, worrying she was going to make an appearance because she likes to walk across my keyboard. Um, but we were saved from, from her intrusions. Okay, since we're actually well over the official time, anyways, uh, thanks again for the lively, for, again, for the great presentations and then also for the lively discussion. Um, those were very awesome, pretty awesome papers. Um, thanks for your patience, everybody, <laughs> for listening to this extended discussion. Yes, must, thank you. Must have been interesting, otherwise people would have, I suppose, tuned off. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, that's it also for uh, our Thursday program. Um, we'll be back uh, tomorrow, um, 4 p.m. European time or 9 Eastern or where, where, wherever you are for the final day of our conference. Um, good night or whatever, or have a, enjoy the rest of the day wherever you are uh, and uh, I'll see you, okay. I guess, tomorrow. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Good to meet you.